So let's go. Actually, we are a little bit cheap uh, of the, because of the title, but I thought that people might come if they were thinking that I don't have to know go that much to start. The nice thing is that, that you will soon uh, learn to know that I don't go either. <laughs> uh, so who am I? I'm just this Commodore guy, and I got this computer, and I started programming, and I've been working in computers and so on. And uh, I just wanted to talk to you to about like the Turo Pascal thing, so you understand this background in object Pascal and stuff, because that's one thing I want to talk to you about, because I, that's one thing that I like about Go, about typing. Uh, and I like uh, open, soft, open source software. So, this game, I'm a beginner, so factual errors might be common here. But the, uh, use the QA afterwards and like, correct me, it's no problem. The meaning is that we should go from here, we should know more than when we came here. So. Uh, uh, I often also have lots of opinions, so not everything is facts. And we might put really wrong issues in our brains because I might go fast through some examples. So why do we need Go now? Why do we need the next compiled language? It's because uh, now we have uh, lots of scripting languages that have become more and more popular, but we need something that's easy. And there is no clear like, successor to C and C++. Uh, and I have been looking at those alternatives here. I've been working with Java several years, but I think it's a little... Oh, and uh, C Sharp, I think, thought it was very nice when it came, and lots of new features showed up so soon, but the fact it's on the owner of Windows. So uh, I've been looking at others briefly, like D and Nimrod, there are lots of others that I have just you know, started up and tried some few things in, but I couldn't like, get that feel that I wanted. So why did it go take off so far <laughs> for me? Um, and uh, comparing this to the program. So first it's compiled. By compiled I mean, by compiled I mean that it's uh, like real machine code. So it's in the same ballpark as C and C++, speed-wise. In the same ballpark means here it might be that the particular optimized program is running like uh, just half as fast in Go or one third as fast, but it's still in the same like ballpark, not like 10 times slower usually or 50 or 100 times slower as it is in many scripting languages. So it compiles very fast. That's also very important for me because that's what I'm used to. I'm used to just pressing a button and it should run, so you shouldn't actually see the difference between run, uh, playing around in the scripting language and uh, playing around the compiled language. This is a good thing to go. And also the ability to type everything, which I will soon talk about much more. And also go provide other things like duct typing to interfaces and uh, object literals, which are just nice for rigging, closures and goal things. And, uh, okay, so about programming languages, though. They live a lot longer than other things in computing. Other things are very simple. We are passing through the different technologies and different like speeds we have to rely on and so on. But pro uh, programming languages, they take a while to take on and then they live for a long, long time, usually. So, and the competition is very stiff, as you will see here. I just, uh, I just did, uh, stole some <laughs> graphics from other side here. And uh, as you can see, I, I just wanted you to notice the curves, as you can see there. Do you, does everyone see it? Good. Yeah. You see this curve? And the curve is very, very steep. So uh, uh, when you are at, like, I think that this is like number 15 in this list, already you see that the volume here is much, uh, much less. I think what this uh, diagram is actually showing is the number of web searches done for a particular language and then just compare. Why do I think that there might be changes? It's because how computers work today has changed a lot. So today we have lots of more parallelism because of more cores. Today uh, people don't think about computers, but they are like, you know, Google Glass it will soon be everyone's thing and everyone's already going around with the several cores in the folds and stuff. So I, okay, so how can you approach this? You can either like say that you can extend all the languages with the libraries and try to cope with the new things that way. Or if you have a new language, you can build, build more features into that language that support those concepts in a better way. And then you can have this more lean feeling by, uh, in using them. So, what does uh, from uh, object-oriented programming mean in the title? 
So you can go from the static attack languages, like uh, Java, C, Sharp, C++, mm -hmm. Delphi, or you can go from Python, Ruby, JavaScript, and so on. And depending on where you come from, uh, it, I, I just try to describe what you can expect. So, coming from a static type language, I think that, yeah, so inference is one thing that is really nice in Go. There are other languages, as I pointed out, that already has gotten this feature, but usually it came a long time after the language was introduced, which means that there's a good, quite big code base that already is in place that isn't using this feature. Uh, and also, I think there is uh, better type safety because I think that we lost something when we started object-oriented uh, object somewhere in the middle of the night or something like that, most of us. And we, we lost the ability to like, type the things down on the primitives. So when we have age in, a, in an object or a name or something, it becomes uh, a string or an integer or something. We don't say that this is a type of a certain type, usually. So, Coming, coming from a dynamic language, on the other hand, you will feel if you, you will definitely feel that Go is more than level. That's no no way around that. So pointers are available, you will see them, but don't let that like scare you because they are not as as fearsome as it was in back in C. <laughs> there it was like the nightmare of nightmares. And you don't have the full elasticity either that you're used to if you're using a, a scripting language, and you usually okay, you have to pass this instance <laughs> somewhere and you want to put some more uh, information you just do this extra property and tuck something on and off it goes and then it comes out on the other, uh, on the other side with this information. You cannot think that way in Go because it's statically uh, typed, you have to like, think about it. But still, uh, it's a system language with lots of high productivity contracts, they have been looking at the current uh, scripting languages and taken uh, some things that are very important to make programming easier. And uh, yeah, I think that Go is very, very easy to pick up. And I've been working with scripting programming for several years now, so I'm more or less used to that. What is inference then? So every Go program uh, starts with this main, function main, that's quite common in many languages. Uh, and this is a very simple example where I just want to show you. First, we define this, actually, we infer this uh, I1 becomes, it's, it's like declared and assigned at the same time, right? And you don't even have to write up the type because one is an uh, integer literal. So it like comes to the conclusion, the compiler comes to the conclusion by compiling that i1 is an integer and it has this value. What happens with i2 then? Okay, so i2 is inferred from the result of running this function, which is an int64 returner. Quite a stupid function, but just to show this, this um, like, uh, functionality. So I2, which type will it be? It will be in 64 because the compiler knows what we, what what is coming out of the in 64 return. And the interesting thing here is that if I want to like add those two numbers together, I have to cast the I1 to in 64. Otherwise, the compiler will be angry at me. And why is that? So <coughs> uh, back in the C times. Uh, there was lots of uh, well, actually we have had lots of confusions going up until today because of the autocasting in C. So there is a long table of like the rules that are happening when you have this type and this type it becomes this type and then if you add this type it will become that type. And uh, programmers a don't, they forget this table and b uh, they like they don't see when they are written in a complex expression they don't like get it okay. So we I don't, I'm not saying, talking about you I'm talking about uh, uh, everyone else. Everyone is, is able to do this error and that's why you have to be explicit in some cases go, but implicit in uh, like for instance the inference thing. So you don't have to repeat yourself as much. This is an example from a very popular language that you can, which you can like, <laughs> remember the good times of programming. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that okay this code is is rather clear, but it's so much of it. So if you try to write some logic in it, the problem will be that you will like miss it in the volume. Okay, and the inference operator, huh? it has some cool superpowers. It's like this thing. You see, this is like this uh, if statement. This part up until the semicolon is like the initialization of it. And the thing is here, okay? So you have this map, and you can use a key to to uh, get some, to index some uh, uh, info from it. 
those here are both inferred, so you get the right types on user and exist without saying anything. And exist is always, in this case, a Boolean value. So it tells you if it actually found something on this key. And the nice thing is that it's just one single line, then you have the test here on exist, and then you have that user and exist only, uh, those variables are only available in this block. So, and uh, similarly in the for construction, Notice also that uh, for is used for all uh, loops in Go. So you have different like syntactic constructions when you are using for for every loop. This is, this is a particular brand of for loop where you have this range. So this is like what you would say for each in most other languages. Something like that for each, you know. Um, and we are uh, working on this map again. And here you see that we can take out both the key and the value. Uh, and it's inferred, you don't have to declare the types, and it's uh, again just local to this block. Very useful. So, type safety. Uh, when does typing matter? This is the example from the Mars Climate Orbiter from Wikipedia, this link. And they had a problem with uh, like those uh, units that didn't match. I, I haven't seen their source, I, I don't know if this would like, fix this particular problem. But I'm just saying that it's very easy to go. You take like, one of the like, primitive types in the language and you re retype it to whatever you want to do. So it's very like, natural that you say, okay, if you're talking about the length of centimeters, then just call it that. In this example, again you have main, then this is the, like, the long uh, form of de declaring a, a variable. Uh, so this time I'm doing a force that is a bound force, and then I have this force 2 that is inferred from the... Yeah, I cast this value to Newton, so this becomes Newton. And what happens then when I try to do an operation and do those two together? I get this very, very clear and uh, describe being error. And it's so, so, so clear because it says, okay, this is, the, uh, this, is this expression, and it's a type Newton, it isn't a bound force. Typing is easy. I would recommend it. This is, this is my opinion. I think you don't have to do it. My opinion is that you can type lots of things in your programs, even on the primitive types. So you're doing like the open ID name is string, and then you have age and height are integers. Then we create a structure using those uh, new types that we just created or defined. And then we have a map that corresponds with the map that was in the previous example. Uh, and all is now typed, so we can create yeah, like things of each of those types. Uh, but sti still Go is not in our way. You don't have to cast all the type. Like for instance, if you have this, okay, this is like you, here you create the instance of the real map in the like, previous uh, example, and then you add a value to it. You, you see that still, even though it was an open ID, this key, I don't have to uh, say that like uh, in special, I just send in the string because it's a string, so go with code. Okay, so types, everything is declarable, uh, or oh, everything declarable is typable. I said almost because I'm not really sure, but I think it's probably almost true at least. <laughs> and then you have, it's not like a hash defined from C, and uh, typing might make you a better programmer. So, uh, yeah. Uh, you can read type types that are built in and, and user defined, and you can add methods on things that are local. But you cannot you cannot like retype uh, something that you have imported in some way, and that's a very good thing. So you can like rely on things you are you have imported, uh, and you can retype things and you can extend them with methods, and you can also yeah you can type pretty much everything. This is very uh, similar to Pascal. That's why I mentioned it in the beginning that you can okay this is like the array of area of int and it's a matrix. So, this is an example of the retype. What I want to show, this is the first actual uh, Go program that is runnable, by the way, in this presentation. You have to write this, okay, package name, you have to say which package you are in, and this is the default package, and we are importing this one to be able to print out on the screen. You can from that think with this one. But the important part is coming here. Type my int, uh, integer. So, okay, notice also like the, <laughs> the way this goes, uh, as opposed to like C, but and this is an integer, it's like the normal type in this language, and then you have my int, that's what I define. And that allows me to be able to put a uh, method on top of the my int, and then I can use the method. 
but as you can see here in the print. So I'm creating this, this is, uh, again in figures, which is usually what you do in all methods, I would say. So you have this uh, integral literal casted to my int, it comes out here as m, and then I'm using, so I'm printing m as it would be a normal integer because it is, but it's my flavor of it. And then I can also call this twice method on top of this my, my type integer. Uh, one thing that's also important in this example is like the layout of the function declaration. The function declaration, okay, so this is, this is an optional part where you can say that I'm operating, this function is operating on the type, that's optional. Then you have the name, that's also optional because in Go, uh, like, um, functions are first as citizens, so you can have like anonymous functions that change, they, they are as any type. And then you have this one, which I, I think that this, uh, this parenthesis here, I think it's uh, actually obligatory. But it can be empty as here, and that means that this function doesn't take any arguments, or it can, it can do that. And then, um, uh, which are return type you have. Also, if you add like a parenthesis around the return type, you can add more of them. And that's cool. What, what is it here that makes you able to use twice as a type method? Or? Because I said that I'm I'm applying this as a method by this thing on top of my new type. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll look at it later. <laughs> okay, so typing is not a hash. We can go through this quick. It's not like in C that you just uh, replace uh, or mark your text or something. The compiler knows everything about what you do, so you have help from the compiler with the typing. Uh, and how Go can make you a better programmer? I would say, every, every time you're doing something, just tell the compiler what you actually mean. Like, do this, okay, map an age to degrees Celsius or something. And it will be much easier when you're refactoring things, or your colleague or, uh, is refactoring things uh, a while later. So you don't, like, mix up things and put some other kind of length into that field. Okay. Then we're going to scope. So, this is... Okay, this is also how like packages work in Go, this picture. Uh, first you have the built-in libraries. When you norm normally install Go, you've got the, you the built-in libraries, the universe, and then usually you set up the Go path, which will point to some, at, at, the, mo uh, at the beginning, empty uh, folder, usually in your home directory. Go is also its own package manager, so the same command that you are using with Go run, Go build, you can also do like Go get and Go install. And that's what you do. So you usually you do Go get, uh, go get and some URL on GitHub or something, and you get this library that you want to play around with. And then you do a go install on that one. It's, it's available there. And also available then, uh, as long as you have to do the same go path, of course, to your application, which you might be building. And uh, your application can uh, consist of like one or more packages. So main, of course, you have to have the main package, but then you can have more if you want to modularize. And the point of this picture is actually, okay, what do you do to like, what do you do to talk about things in packages in, from different from other packages? So if I want to talk in package A about things that are in from the like uh, go path or uh, in package A about things that are in package B, right? And the only rule that is, as far as I know, is just that you capitalize, you, you do a large letter. You do the uppercase on the first letter. And that's just making it pass over so you can very easily see on any name all the time if it's just if it passes through through different packages, or if it's just locally available. If it's a lowercase, it's a locally available. I think it's probably the easiest I have seen in any language so far. General rules for scope is, okay, so the universe, the, there are things that are like built in, uh, in the language. Uh, like, for instance, all the, all the types, like integer and stuff like that, and then you have some strange uh, functions like uh, make and append and stuff like that, that are built in. By the way, I don't like them very much, but that's another thing. And then you have like the package uh, where you define something on the top level, outside of any function, you define some variables or uh, types or something, and then it's uh, available in the package. Then you have the current file, that's used when importing, because when you import another package, you don't want that to like clutter up some other file that happens to be in the same package, you could be very confused because of the namespace thing. So you want that import to just be for that file, and that's one level. Then, the, then you have the function button that's nested because, of course, uh, functions are first class citizens, so whichever depth you want. And then you have the block, as I showed, showed you before with if and for statements. Then a short one in init to freeze. <coughs> so if you remember all the variants, 
you might uh, frown. But. Um, yeah, so uh, what are interfaces for then? You can use them like references for multiple types. And it feels like a duct typing niche if you're um, if you have been scripting along, you are, you are very like, used to this, that you just call something on something that seems to have it, and it will usually work. And that's basically what it does. You can fake marker interface also. So interfaces, again. Uh, yeah, you have the package main and import something that we can print with. I create a, a meow interface here. It's called meow because it has a meow function, uh, or meow duration, function duration, definition. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, and uh, in Go it's like this, okay, so if you have like this interface that has only like one method uh, read, then it's a reader, and then you have like the one method write is a writer. So this is a meow because it has meow, okay? And it looks exactly like this. It has this name and it has uh, this like signature, right? No uh, parameters and this return type. Okay. So we're going to use that soon. Now I create a cat, and uh, cat is very, uh, it's just an empty structure. But I use cat because I want to uh, put a, a method on it. For the first time you see this, ooh, you see that? <laughs> so, it's, it, uh, you might be scared if you are pretty probably see, but it's not that scary. Actually it just means that we are talking about the reference of cat. More or less like, self in Python, the first parameter, you know, or something like that. So, okay, uh, so cat has this method meow, and it's the same as you see in this part of the like, signature, and this matches this one, and you say, okay, it returns meow. So we create, first we create a new cat, and we, we cast it through a meower, and we infer it into animal, so animal is a meower, and we just print it out, and it says that it says meow. Uh, the important part in this picture is that note that there is no connection between the cat and the meower, okay? So the only thing making it like fit in the interface is at compile time when you do this cast and the compiler like, checks if it matches this interface. And that's an important part. It's, it's like a strength in Go. You can use interface for that. You can also use empty interfaces to match anything like an integer and uh, things like that. Uh, my personal opinion is that you should avoid that unless you're writing something very special, like an ORM library or something. But that's my personal opinion. Coroutines? Um, <laughs> I don't always start like half a million simultaneous threads in the MacBook Air, but when I do, it's in GoLang. <laughs> I've tried it actually, so it actually works. The thing is that uh, the implementation is not defined in the language specification, so there are two implementations of uh, Go language, and one of them is using OS threads, that one that is uh, based on the GCC chain. Then we have the other one that is based on, on event loops or whatever uh, such uh, uh, thing there is in the current operating system. And they are... Okay, so, so that one, that, uh, that compiler is based on, on the plan 9 chain, tool chain. Uh, it's like, you can call them proto threads. And they are very, very lightweight. So this actually, it will, it will allocate two gigabytes of ROM on my computer while like that's starting up and then doing its thing and going down. Uh, but it actually works, right? <laughs> Half a million like concurrent things. Pretty cool. But you can just think about them as threads usually. But there is another thing in uh, Gold is also very nice when it comes to. Uh, working with threads, and that's channels. So it's, uh, it's based on some kind of theory that's called CSP that I don't know anything about, but they use that to create channels. And it's a cool thing, I've heard that there are other languages that also implement things that are based on that, like aid or something. Uh, but uh, in Go it's cool because I use Go, so <laughs> I have some kind of a... Um, so I can use it. So I just wanted to show you uh, using a channel and why it's cool. So, uh, let's start at main here. We know that the program starts here, so we are doing the ca this counter channel. This is inferred from making the channel of type integer, and we set the size to 1 of that channel. And then we are using the uh, Go keyword, which is actually starting up this other thread, so to speak, protocol. There's a new flow in the other program, and uh, this is calling this uh, function here. And this function here, 
as when you first look at it, it looks like it would be a very, very fast loop that would be, would be soon over. Uh, but what we do here is, okay, let's first look at this declaration here. You see that counter channel, this time, I say that uh, channel, I put an arrow on it, so I say that it has a direction. I cannot by accident use it the other way, because that would be, might be very bad. This is a unidirection channel, but when it comes here, it can only be used in one direction, when I pass it here. So what happens when we, uh, okay, so then we have this loop and we are passing the i from this iteration to the counter channel, and then we just print out that we did that. And down here in the um, real program where the like, other flow continues, we are 10 times, we are picking out something from the counter channel. And you see that, okay, so this expression, it, it is an integer we are like pulling out of this channel. You see this arrow here is going from the channel. It's going, it, this arrow here is going into the channel. The result of running this program is like this. So, first, uh, the feeder, so to speak, the counter generator is feeding one, and then the other one has to pick out one because it just has a buffer of one. So it has to be like this. Let's say then that we just put five in the in the size of the channel, and not surprisingly, you get this result instead. So, I hope everyone understands the channel flow. <laughs> <laughs> so, in the sign of Go, I would say it's, it's uh, they have thought lots about like the minimum surprise. You have no, no operator overload, you have no function overload, you have replacement of methods, altering behavior of important types, you cannot do that. No default parameters, there's lots of things you cannot do that you are like used to. You have compiler errors when you like even define the variable that you won't use. And what does this result in? It results in programs that you actually, when you have a large application, you can just jump into this little window of it, and usually you will understand what happens. In C++, you can say it's the opposite. It's like hell. You cannot at all know what the program is doing unless you know the whole code base. <clears throat> I think that was by design. So, they are not trying to uh, match every feature from past languages when they were doing Go. Uh, but they, was just, uh, they were just looking at things that look good to have. And, okay, so what is the, the pro of this? I would say that, uh, I, I already mentioned it's very easy to like, pick up and read the code and everything. I think that they have managed to do this because it's a very compact language and you don't have that many features. Uh, but also, the, the con here, and this is... Uh, a reference to this object-oriented programming thing that that other programmers are that haven't been using Go yet. You cannot think the same way as you would in a normal language when you have classes and object instances and inheritance and stuff like that. You have to rethink the problem and try to think it in a way where you have this this uh, toolbox with the Go tools instead, and you will be much more happy. Nice things is you have zero initialized memory, so local variables are okay. They might be, but the thing is. If you have, since it Go is this parallelized language, uh, you can have the, that you, you start some kind of value, you start like this, uh, this structure, this uh, primitive or anything. If you take a reference of it and just pass it into some other flow by using this Go keyword and passing it on, then you, you normally you wouldn't know, okay, so who is managing this and, and what's happening with this and what happens when this, uh, like for instance, primitive is going out of the scope, right? Don't care about that. The compiler will manage, okay? Just take the reference and use it however you like, and the compiler will manage, and the garbage collector will manage. So, multiple return values, that's cool. Uh, drastically reduced chance of buffer overflow and dangling pointers, as compared to other system languages. So, I already mentioned that, because garbage collection, and because also because like things that have a size, like arrays and stuff, have actually a size that is part of the type. It makes it much more, much less probable that you will be able to point at something that isn't there. And uh, there is no, okay, my, my, you might call one of them the reference implementation, but actually I would, what I mean is that the specifications of the language are very, very good. And I really like that about Go, that they were actually focusing on, like, you can describe the language in documents. And there is a very, very good reflection API as well, but I don't have the time to cover that. So it goes to that part. Uh, I don't like parts in languages where they have like constructs that I cannot use as a user of the language, but they have that in the like base of the language, like make and stuff. 
I don't, this is not constructive criticism because I don't have like this replacement for that. It's nice, but I'm just saying that I don't like it. And uh, I, I'm also uh, thinking that object liberals, without enforcing being explicit about fields, it might be strange if you're doing object liberals and you are like uh, counting on position, and then you might change the struct. And I don't know what might happen, but I'm just thinking it might be a bad idea, but that's my thing. Uh, that's, that, those are the things I was thinking about when I was thinking about what I don't like about Go. I will still use it though. <laughs> Uh, error handling. Lost almost at the end now. So error handling. I uh, saved this for last because this is one of the things that people actually <gasps> about when they first see go. And uh, panic. <laughs> <laughs> almost. Yeah, yeah. You just lose the exceptions, right? And it's like so scary. <laughs> but, uh, okay, so it's very very controversial, and people that uh, use it to accept exceptions, they have a hard time to accept that. But note that there is another language that has become very, very popular uh, uh, during the last time that is using basically the same mechanics, okay? You have this, okay, where you have when something comes back, it returns an error if it has been there, if it was the result of like one asynchronous operation or something like that. Uh, so I don't have to convince the Node.js programmers here that it's a good thing, but okay. So one thing to remember about like <laughs> exceptions, I have seen like exceptions misused so much in other languages. This is like a, a, a pseudo argumentation on the side, but people have actually used like exceptions for flow control and stuff like that, and that's just bizarre. It is, and not all errors are any errors. I mean, like you have this. Okay, so find what found error exception. I'm throwing that in your face. You shouldn't because that's normally part of normal logic in a, in a language. You should be able to check for it and then say, okay, I'm creating the file for you, or I'm using the file you already have. <laughs> and also, okay, so you have two general strategies usually when you're handling errors. Okay, you, either you can handle it where, there and then where you are, or you have to pass it upwards to someone who cares, or to someone that can do anything about it. And notice that error handling in Go, where you have, usually you have one of the return values, because you can have multiple of them, you just pass this error on. It's basically the same, uh, that's what's happening in Java, right? Either you can like, trap the exception and handle it in a good way, or you have to say that this method, with this particular method you are writing that is using something and that can throw something, must say that it throws it further on, upwards the chain. So I would say there is no difference, um, yeah, we can discuss it later. If you <laughs> disagree. Uh, so, in response to Goldings, in case you would be interested in looking more to go after this, Strange talk. Uh, I would say, okay, so golang.org, uh, of course, that's the official site, and I would say that the ref spec, I love the ref spec, and I think that all languages should have a ref spec. It's a grammar of the language, but not only that. It also is like annotated, so the people have been re writing a commentary about like the constructs of the language. And yeah, that's my taste, but I really like that one. That's it. I hope it was informative in some way. So if anyone has questions, please ask them now. Uh, what are what are the types of functions? Are functions properly typed? Yeah, uh, you can use them as types in Go. You can do it like this inference operator, and then you can just say func something without even a name. And it's an anonymous function that is inferred into that. Yeah, for, for example, if you have a plus function which takes, which takes integer and integer and returns an integer. Okay. Which, uh, is it something like Haskellish types, or is it just type function? Or is it the type of the return? So, so do you mean that as a method, or do you mean like a function that just takes two integers? That is like without a, a, a connection to the type in itself? Uh, actually, <laughs> I think the, the difference is terminology calling the type and method signature. Like those two are the same in other languages and different in other languages. That's what we mean. I think what you mean is that uh, the type of a function depends on its parameters and the return value. Yeah, yeah. So if they have different uh, parameters and uh, different return values, they're not the same type. Okay. Is it true for Go? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay.
Uh, then you mentioned that you have looked at D as well. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm uh, just interested on on what you see as the the what is better in Go and uh, why made wh what made you choose or well, switch. I didn't like uh, study D very very much, but the thing was that when I was looking at it, it looked like it was a very very small company and behind it a little, everything wasn't like open about the implementation of it. So we we didn't feel that that good to like put lots of like energy to learn it at the time. I'm sorry, were you looking at D version one or D two? I don't remember. Okay. It was a long time ago. I just wanted to like say the fact that okay. we're looking for this compiler I want to use. Actually, actually, the language evolved quite a bit since like 2000 and something. Six. Okay. Yeah. I, I just thought that now that Go is here, it has a good backing. <laughs> yeah. Are you still using uh, Delphi Pascal in uh, any context? Actually, I haven't used it like for three years now, but uh, I still like it. Somewhere. <laughs> no, I'm an old time. Yeah. <laughs> you will like the topic system in case you. Yeah. Yeah, I've been looking. Okay. Yeah. Hmm?